Gracious eternal Father, we bring thanksgiving unto you this morning for the breaking of a new day, the gift of a new week, and more importantly, the gift of our own lives. We thank you for your mercy that was our help in the week that has just passed. We thank you for the favor that has opened another one for us, and we thank you for the privilege you give unto us to come into thy presence and bring a worship and a thanksgiving. The Bible said you inhabit the praises of your people and by this we know you are here with us this morning. We pray Lord that you might, we might feel your presence. Come by indeed and do those things that you are known for. Give us thy word Lord that we illuminate our heart and make us to be light footed to be witnesses of your resurrection. Please take us deeper in your love and take us higher in your joy. Let there be a surround of your spirit. The blessings that we have received of your presence this far, Lord, may they prosper in our lives. The teachings of the Sunday school, Lord, let it minister the entrance of your kingdom, even unto our dear hearts. The worship of thy people, Lord, may you accept. Even our person, may you accept this morning. Let there be nothing, O God, between our soul and the Savior. Give us access into the heavenlies, that we might enjoy the things that have been freely given to us. If there be souls that are coming on their way, may you guide their path here safely. Those still in their houses, please give them a quickening. And we that are here, may you prepare our heart for your visitation. Move through the audience, Almighty God, but don't pass no one by. May you stop at the post of each person. Please discern their needs and grant to them the substance of their request and their desires. Bless your people, set to them, establish them. May your angel go before us in this new week, O God, to defeat every plans of the devil and to open the windows of heaven that your blessings may pour upon us beyond what we have ever known that by the turn of the same we shall look back with gladness and celebrate progress, victory, blessings, O oh God, and everything that heaven will afford us. Do it for us this day. Do it for us this week. As we commit ourselves, thy word, and this time into thy care, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you, saints. The Lord bless you, saints. Aha, that sounds better. God bless you, you are welcome. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to keep you standing. Uh, I want us to read the word. Amen. Then you can take your seat. I was going to... I don't know. I was kind of going to pull back from my promise last uh, Thursday. But I felt put back into it again. And uh, this morning, I got to know the reason. Uh, with the teaching in the Sunday school, I think that's the reason God took me out of that range. I was going to speak in line of the four, uh, not the four beasts, but the four living creatures. <laughs> but then from the Sunday school, I learned we are traveling to that journey. So I will not, uh, I will not overtake Brother James. <laughs> Amen. How many enjoyed the Sunday school? That was a very good teaching. Uh, teaching positionally places the church. I want us to take those things very serious and dear to our hearts. There are not things you get. I'm not saying you don't get them on message pulpit, but there are not things you get just anywhere. They, they are the revealed word for the hour. And the revealed world are meant for people who are elect of God. Brother Bram said, God does not teach Cain's children revelation, but he does teach his own 
Because it is by revelation that we overcome. The power to overcome is actually the opening of the book. A lot of people carry the Bible all over the surface of the earth. Just like we do. I'm sorry I'm keeping you standing, but they say it's healthy sometimes. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. They, 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 they have the Bible, and about three or four billion people on the earth today carry Bible. But they are carrying a closed book. Amen. And uh, it takes the opening of the book in order for you to get the revelation of what you are carrying. And it is the revelation that gives you overcoming power. But the question is to how many were these things opened to? If you study the scripture, it, the revelation is very selective. God is very selective when it comes to revelation. While he was here in flesh, in the body called Jesus, in the open air, he preaches in parable. But for those who want to have the revelation of the parable, they must follow him to his closet, which today is the secret place of the Most High. Then when they come to that closet, he will start telling them, expanding the parable. He was conscious, he spoke in parables. Jesus knew what he was doing. So it wasn't accidental, it wasn't accidental. It's just his manner. Then the disciples took so much note of that and said, how come outside you always speak in uh, parables? But when we come into the closet, you expound the thing. You know the answer he gave. An unapologetic answer. He said, because unto you it is given. So meaning that to the outsider, uh-huh. But unto you it is given to know the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdom. So there are a select group that these things are meant for. So brethren, let us freely enjoy the things that are meant for us. Hold tight unto them. You don't know what those things are doing in your life. And you see, when the bride is receiving seed, she relaxes. And she's very happy. And she's very excited. That is the way we must be in the presence of God. For the seed of the word we are, rece we are receiving to bring, uh, uh, to bring what? Conception. Amen. If you are in the state of worry, anxiety, you don't conceive. It is the truth. It has been proven even medically. That you've got to really relax and be at peace with yourself. So what you are hearing could prosper. So this is why the prophet said the right mental attitude. You've got to come with the right attitude. If you came in with the wrong attitude, you'll go back feeling no virtue. And in that place where you felt nothing, somebody is testifying. So if there's anything in your heart, clear it. Hallelujah. So the presence of the Lord can always be a blessing to you. So how many appreciate that teaching this morning? And uh, we are going to get more by the grace of God. God bless you, Brother James. And God bless all the Sunday school teachers. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Amen. So this morning, let's turn to the book of Job. Job chapter 1. This Job chapter 1 we are reading, it's a background. My subject from it is lessons from the book of Job. So we are going to get many things. Amen. We're just using Job as the sheave that we want to weave this morning. But many things, by the grace of God, will come from it. And I hope it's a blessing to you. All right. Job chapter 1. <clears throat> if you are there, say amen. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. I want you to see the description of the Bible and of our God himself about this great character. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. 
And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned, and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, now watch God's description of this man, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. That was what God said of this man. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Thou Job fear God for naught? As not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and uh, about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that the art is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yeah, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is falling from heaven and had burned up the sheep and the servants and uh, consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was here speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yeah, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was here speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote all four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and did what? Worshipped. Amen. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return tither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all these, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. While you are sitting, I want us to uh, continue in the second chapter. I'll take the first ten verses. The second chapter. And again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou moved me against him to destroy him without cause. Without a reason. Underline those words. And Satan answered the Lord and said, 
skin for skin. Yeah, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thy hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will cause thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to unto his crown. And he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. In other words, you and the foolish woman, why are you talking like that? What? What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all these did not Job sin with his lips. Amen. Permit me to read the last three verses because we need to talk about these friends. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came everyone from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Namatite, for they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when he, they lifted up their eyes afar off and they knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent everyone his mantle, and sprinkled dust upon their heads towards heaven. So they sat with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none speak a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Amen. So this morning, we're speaking on lessons from the book of Job. Amen. The prophet told us that uh, Job lived around the era of uh, Enoch, Noah, and the rest of them. And this book of Job is the oldest book of the Bible. And sometimes, uh, God has his witnesses everywhere. Sometimes, some of these witnesses might not readily be known, but they exist. While Enoch, Noah, and the rest were taking the center stage in the book of Genesis, God who was keeping all records. Remember, the Bible said, the scriptures were not written in the old time by the will of men, but by men of God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that wrote the scripture through the Bible, or through, uh, uh, that wrote through the scribes. It was the Holy Spirit that sorted out the manuscripts that will make the scriptures and it was the Holy Spirit that put each manuscript in its sequence in order to form a book of life that will be a blessing unto you and I. So one of the manuscripts that was accepted was the book of Job. But this man who lived in the seasons of Enoch and the rest of them, his book was to come later, as if he lived later. It never had any prominence or mention even in the book of Genesis. And yet, it was such an important man to God. This is a lesson that wherever you are, in your own little corner, be faithful. Whether you are known or you are not known, it doesn't matter. What is important is that the most important person to know you is God, and he does know you. Amen. Amen. There was a time, Prophet Elijah was so perplexed and frustrated, and he felt he was all alone in the battle and in the zeal for the Lord. And when the Lord wanted to comfort his prophet, he came to him and said, Elijah, I have left 7,000, not seven people, not 700, 7,000 in the land of Israel that have not bowed down to Baal. 
They might be in the village. They might be in a little corner where nobody could see them, but they exist. And the all-seeing eye of God is watching them enough to know even their number count. He said, I have 7,000 that have not bowed down to Baal. So I want to tell the believers this morning that you are not alone in this journey. And you will never be alone. Amen. Always remember that somewhere, somehow, somebody is also standing for the faith like you are doing. And for those who may not want to stand, remember while you are misbehaving, somebody is not misbehaving. Amen. And you don't want that witness of another person to be your judgment. The judgment of God is not going to be like, uh, it, will, it will bring out books. But do you know the biggest book of remembrance is you and I? Are you following? Brother Bram said, it is going to be the testimony of the believer against the unbeliever. Amen. So when somebody will rise up and make an excuse of why he wasn't able to do the right thing where he was, God will look around within the context of that arena and say, Sister, please get up and testify. And by the time she gives her testimony, her testimony becomes a whip to that excuse. That is the judgment. So God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my sister. Do not be weary in your service to the Lord. You are never alone. In whatever you are going through also, you are never alone. The greatest lie the devil can teach us or tell us is to think that things we go through are only peculiar to us. Are you following me? Is that this is not as not and probably will not happen to anyone else. It is a peculiar problem for, uh, for me whom God has made peculiar and then separated for this particular problem. It's a lie. You see, the moment you accept that lie of the devil, Satan has won the battle round one. And he has a place he's going. If the devil is going to this place and he knows that everybody knows that this place is dangerous, it doesn't start from here, there. It goes like this, it turns like this, it moves like this, till you will get yourself in that place you will not realize. This is why any appearance of the devil must be shown. The prophet said the wisdom of God is not in how close we come to sin and not commit it. But the wisdom of God is in how fast and how far we can shun its appearance. You love him this morning. So if he tells you that and you accept, he has won the battle round one. Then the next stage of the battle will be to ask you, why would God single you out for a peculiar problem? And then you begin to sing the song, Why Me, Lord? In fact, sometimes that song can be a selfish song. If it is not you, whom else do you want it to be? Point to the fellow. But you know, friends, for everything God permits us to go through, is because he has designed us for it with the capacity to handle it. Let me tell you, it is God that makes choices in these things. And not man. We're going to see it from Job. Job had no idea when God was having a bargain deal with Satan over him. And guess where it took place? In the church. The Bible said, and it came to pass when the sons of God present themselves before the Lord. Don't think that's some too mystical thing. It's church service. That's what it means. What are we doing here this morning? We are presenting ourselves before the Lord. So I can put it in contemporary language. It came to pass when the children of God came for service. Are you catching it? Yes, sir. They came for service. And the Bible told me Satan also came for service. Some of you don't agree with that. But Satan comes for service. He's here this morning. Hmm? He goes to church. 
But you see, that Satan will come to church is not the issue. But what we allow him in church is the thing. We can create such an atmosphere in the church to render him useless in the service. That is what the right atmosphere of service must be. We must create an atmosphere that render him useless. If he wants to come, he is welcome. But when he comes, we put him in a chain of circumstance that he cannot operate. He will remain an observer throughout the service. But for us to achieve that, we must be one together. Our hearts must be one. Our aims must be one. So if there is anything separating you from the body, you become the problem for that body. The chain is strongest at its weakest link. Are you following me, church? We are only as strong as we are knitted together. This is why the prophet said, if you are not living the right kind of life, he said, repent. Because you can become an outlet through which the devil will disturb the body. Mm -hmm. Am I quoting the message of the hour? Am I preaching the scriptures to you? Amen. I don't want to be an indebtedness to the body. I don't want to be a liability to the body. This is why if I'm part of that body, I must give my all. It must be total. Amen. It must be total in faith. It must be total in conduct. If I do not understand anything, I must clear it. But once I clear it and I understand it, I must give my all. This is why Brother Bram said, we want the gift in the church. But first, we want the giver. The giver is love. Because God is love. That is why Brother Bram said, if you have all the gifts... Amen. But you don't have love. You don't have a church. Are you with me, saints? You don't have a church yet. And he said, if you ask me to make a choice, he said, I will choose love and leave the gift. Because where there is perfect love, eventually there will be perfect gifts. There is no point having a gift without love. It will not bring glory to God. This is the order of the kingdom. When the prophet went beyond the curtain of time, what he made was perfect love. And when he was brought back, all he was trying to, you know, you say somebody traveled, what did you bring? You understand? And maybe Americans don't do that. We do that as Africans. Amen. All right. So if you ask the prophet what he brought beyond the curtain of time, it was perfect love. That was all he was saying. And he said, do all you can. He said, whatever any man does, he said, he said don't let it be your hindrance. He said, take it out of the way. He said, get to a point that you rise above your brother's fault. It doesn't even bother you. So you can keep the right kind of heart because that is what it will take to make it in there. So if heaven is founded and arranged by love, we must bring that heaven on the earth. Because these are the citizens, the candidates of that place. The prophet said the reason we come to church is to connect from here to there. Oh, I pray that the spirit of the Lord will expand it to you beyond my own ability to express it. You love him this morning. So what are we saying? Job in his own little corner, God was reckoning with him. And this God came and said, this man, apart from him being the richest in the East, he was also the best believer by God's reckoning. So Job was brother of brothers. A Christian of Christians. You will see, you will appreciate this background as we go on. Because God would not be so explicit on an agenda for nothing. Amen. It's just that sometimes you need to anoint your eyes with eyes have in order to see the message it was passing. Job was a man of serious Christian integrity. 
Integrity in that context is explained as his consistency in the face of any situation. He was a Christian in the morning. He was a Christian in the afternoon. When he travels abroad, he remained a Christian. He wasn't conscious of any other person. He was conscious of the all-seeing high. So whether pastor is there or not, he knows he has an allegiance to the kingdom. He knows he has an allegiance to the one in whose presence he always lives. Is there anyone here who can avoid God's presence? He said he enters all rooms. Even when the doors are being shut, all the lights are off, he can still see. Beyond human, be conscious of that one. Are you following me? When you are conscious of him, it will give you some sort of reverence. It will give you some sort of check. And do you know what the prophet said? I was trying to do all my life for the believers to recognize the presence of God. Job knew that. So he was living right. May the Lord be able to, may the Lord speak this of you and I. It goes to show that God keeps record. And he has a commentary, a remark he could make about each and every one of us. So we are not just living. Amen. We are living our life, it's giving records. And when it's true with us some days, our record will go into the rack. But I see this rack is, nobody can tamper with it. At the appointed time, it will be brought back. Amen. So may God help us. So this man has a solid Christian experience. And the Bible said, as far as the righteousness of that age was concerned, listen to this. Job was living a life worthy of the gospel. He was a man who does not just believe in being a Christian. He also believed in bringing his family under the blood. He wasn't a careless father. He wasn't a man who defend his children blindly. A lot of us, yeah, you could be emotional about your children and be sensitive to their care. But you see, if a child hasn't received the Holy Ghost, create a margin of error in your heart. Don't dismiss every report that comes about him or her. It doesn't make you a better parent. But if you are conscious of that, you may end up not being a parent that will regret it all your life. Whatever comes your way as a report, hold it with one hand and pray about it and observe. God has given you abilities to become the kinsman redeemer, especially you mothers to those children. But sometimes if you don't appreciate the challenges they have, you cannot do your job of redemption properly. Learn this from Job. The Bible said he didn't have to see it. He was conscious of young people's tendency. He knew at the point at which they have met God. He was a parent enough to know the point at which they were struggling. They are still struggling with Christ, with salvation. He is not going to defend or cover for them. He wanted the right kind of life for his children. The Bible said when he goes to make his offering, he, 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 he carries them along. We read it together. He will offer for them and make a provision in his heart. Perhaps this has happened. That was a man who believed in thou and thy house shall be saved. That was a man who believed that until the people, the children, find the need to receive God in their life, he must stand as their Holy Ghost. Mm. But you see, brethren, you cannot give what you don't have. It has got to be in you first before you transfer it. You see the reason why it's important for you to meet God before you meet marriage. You love him this morning. I hope I'm sounding right. 
I hope we are connected to the same frequency. I'm speaking for those intending fathers and intending mothers. Today we are coming up with feeding bottle brothers. Bear with me. Brothers who are not winged yet. Amen. I'm, I'm going to make it clear, brother. Yeah. Brothers who can provide leadership. Amen. They are old enough to take leadership steps, but it's just not in them. They are tied to their parents' apron. My mommy say, my mommy say, and you are supposed to be a husband. Say, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. If you are not matured or ripe enough to leave your father and mother, don't get married. Amen. Because when you get married, you must take charge of the home. I'm not saying become a boss in the house. But you are to provide leadership. No matter how old your wife is, no matter how spiritual she feels, God has placed the leadership of that house in your hands. And you must take it. But you see, the beginning of providing leadership is this. Brother Bram said, you must live like a son of God at home. Are we here? Amen. When you live as a son of God at home, your woman will know when she is seeing something real. When you are making a poor excuse of a Christian life, the closest person to know who you are is your wife, not even your pastor. Except the Lord supernaturally reveals certain things to him. Are you following me? Yeah. So this woman knows you in and out. When Brother Bram was preaching reverence to the woman, which is part of it, there's a story that looks so silent in the book of Job. And that is the story of his wife. Because most times, the recordings, the commentaries are always more about men than of women. But you see, if Job was this successful in his family living, you can't tell me she didn't have a spiritual woman. Are you listening to me? Because the real backbone of that house is the woman. And I can prove it even by marriage. In marriage, the prophet, the Bible, called the man the earth. Is that right? And he called the woman the body. Now, in the end, you have the brain. So, a lot of uh, conceptions, planning, schemings, and uh, programs and plans are drawn out from here. Is that right? But before this thing can move, before this thing can be done, you need the body. Everything will rot in right here if there is no body to drive it. So if Job was that successful, he's got a great woman at home. And that is what every daughter of God should be. Don't be a liability for the journey. And the beginning of liability is assuming a role that is not yours. For nature to be at peace, to give you peace on earth, they've got to take their position. It is usually said that the moon stays in its position to check the sea. So if the moon leaves its position, the sea is going to overrun the earth. That is the way God arranged it. So when he told women to be under subjection and reverence, God in his wisdom knew what he meant. When he told the man to be the edge to love his wife, he knew what he meant. And that is why he said, if you women are taking the position of being manipulative, you want to lead your husband, and the man also wants to become little Johnny, he said, Johnny, sit here. He said, honey, I'm so glad to even lie down. You are a sissy. A big one at it. You are not the son of God enough that will make the kingdom of God. Because you are in a union that will never make it. Oh, yes. That's the scripture. You've got to take your position. 
when those things are happening, it's the symptoms that that brother, that that sister haven't met God. So if you have met God, your leadership position in the house is to provide guidance. Every, every spiritual or righteous thing must first be seen on you. Then when that woman sees something real, to reverence you becomes easy. That's what the prophet said, thinking man's filter. He said there are only two applications of the word reverence in the scripture. That the church should reverence Christ. And that the husband, the wife should reverence their husband. He said, but the man ought to live such a life. To do what? To generate and attract the reverence. So it is, not, it is not a sermon for a godly woman. Say, obey your husband. Obedience will come naturally if she sees something real. Are you catching it? So if she's a godly woman and she's struggling with obedience as much as she wants to do, let us search the man. Because a lot of times, even these women cover for their husbands. Some of them have been beaten, pop, black, and blue. But they can't tell it out. Because they said it's a family shame. You must expose that family shame in order for redemption to come to your house. You love him. He say, going this way feels like I have three months or four months to stay with you. So we can keep breaking it verse by verse. <laughs> so, but... But what am I trying to bring for you, brethren? Oh, God help us. We'll come to many things as we go on. What am I trying to bring for you, brethren? Job met the requirement of the message of his day. He brought his family under the headship of God. He brought them under the atonement for that hour. And the atonement for this hour is the message of the hour. It is our blood sacrifice. Amen. Because in the message rapture, the prophet said, one of these days, this great bride is going to be marching on to glory. Displaying worth on their chest. He said, displaying the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, the message of the age in which they live in. I don't have the time I can prove it to you. Because worth, oh my, God help us. When Christ offered his blood, he offered his blood to get something. It was that thing which he got back that redeemed you. He had you in mind, but you must get a book, isn't it? According to Revelation chapter 5, there was a book in the hand of him that sat on the throne. If that book wasn't taken, there is no redemption. And guess what? That book is nothing but the Bible. That remains the title deed. But it cannot be effective as a closed book. That was why when he took it by his blood in Revelation chapter 5, in Revelation chapter 6, he started unveiling the book. Amen. So if you ask Christ about his blood, I think I've done that here before. If you, if you don't forget. They say COVID wiped out memories of many things. All right. Amen. When Christ was shedding his blood, according to Revelation 5, he shed it to take a book of redemption. Amen? So he paid the price of the blood for a book in the hand of him that sat on the throne. Isn't it? Now, that book in its closed form is the Bible in the hands of everybody. But that book in its open form became the message of the hour to you. Are you catching it? Now, if you ask Christ, where is your blood? What will he show you? He will show you the book because he paid the blood in order to get the book. If I have $50 and I needed this microphone, I must be ready to give my $50 so I can get the microphone. Now, if you come back and ask me, where is that your $50? What will I show you? The microphone. Is that right? So today, what will Christ show you for his blood? He will show you the book. Amen. For his own blood. Now, in that book is contained your names. That you were the one he actually had in his mind, but he cannot get you without the book. Because it is from that book he will call your name. And everybody who became believer had their name supernaturally. 
That was why the day you were witness to, maybe 10 people were witness to, nine people forsook it, you came inside. And when you came inside, you've gone through all kind of experiences and you still stayed inside. Why? Because your name was among those that were redeemed in that book. You love him this morning. So here was Job meeting all these conditions, following the message of his day. He lived right. He was a believer. And he did, he was doing all he could to place his family under the blood. Then one day, when he came to service, Job doesn't miss service. To miss service, it will have to be the genuine reason. Job never miss service. Whether weekday service or Sunday service, it comes all the time. And is always happy to come. He said, I was glad when they say unto me, if troubles are attacking you out there, the biggest trouble you could have is for Satan to keep you from church. But if you could get to the presence of God, rejoice and tell the devil at the door, you made a mistake but I, by allowing me to get here. You know why? Because here my problem will be solved. Something will be spoken to turn things around for me. Oh, glory to God. So while in service one day, God was looking at his people, attending to them, and he saw Satan in service. Like I told you, Satan comes to service. If that sounds odd to you, just accept it. You say, we'll block him from our, from our service, from the presence of God. The Bible said he comes into the presence of God. So what are you going to do with it? He comes. So till now I say he's welcome. But you know, we are going to stay together. We are going to live the right kind of life. Our hearts and our aims are going to be one. By that we shall put him in limbo throughout the service. Church, are we committing to that? All right. So while they were in service, it was God himself that start the hornet's nest. Learn a lesson. Satan does not have as much access to you as you think he does. He gave a testimony by himself that you see, Job could stand tall in all your recommendations and testimony, God, because there's a hedge around him that not only secured him, you secured all that he has. So this edge secures his health, secures his protection, secures his business, secures his life, secures his family, all around protection. There could not be a better insurance or assurance as that. Satan testified. I'm taking it from his testimony. Are you following? But God came and said, have you considered my servant Job? I don't know who he's going to talk about this morning. Amen. And even if you dodge, God knows the identity of everybody here. And once in a while, because he wants to wave us as his masterpiece. Amen. Let me tell you one thing up front. There is nothing God allows us to go through as seeds of God that are designed to destroy us or to take us out of him is not possible. Because God, as I told you, is not a tempter. He's a tester. Everything God had in mind is to prove you, is to wave you before the brethren as his masterpiece. And he says sometimes he allows us to go through things just for us to be the stabilizer of the body. The things we go through, they are not actually meant for we ourselves. But they are meant to protect a larger picture. There was a time David was tendering the father's sheep. Nobody would have known about that testimony until he himself brought it out. He had a challenge with the bear. He had a challenge with the lion. All alone by himself with his sheep. 
that cannot talk. But it turned out to be the reason he went through those challenges was to become the stabilizer of the national church of Israel. Are you catching it? God foresaw that there is going to be a time of great perplexity, a time of great frustration that could do what? That could turn many away. And he allowed this young man to go through it alone in order that when that time comes, Somebody can stand and say, I know. So they are not going to be relying on hearsay. They are going to face somebody who has gone through it. Who can say, rise up boys, let's march to victory. Because he's got something that he can leverage upon. The ways of God are past finding. God has a purpose for everything. Are you with me, church? And by the way, if God singled you out for any use, head or tail, remember you can't lose. And if he does, it's because he's approved of you. Look at all the wonderful things, testimonies God gave about Job before Satan. He said, have you considered him? Is this? Is this? And God wasn't even scared. That what if this guy betray him or disappoint him? So there must be some quality assurance level. A seal proof testimony that God himself knew could not be tampered with. God will, and God is conscious of the need not to trust flesh and blood. He had said it in his word, woe to him that maketh flesh and blood his trust. So why will he be chasing that for a man like Job, flesh and blood? Look, friends, God could see his quantity in him. God could see the formation of himself in Job. And he was ready to wave him as a masterpiece. You call it challenges, God was adopting Job. If I must reign, I must fight. Increase my courage, Lord. You love him this morning. Have you considered him? That of all my house, is this, is that, is this. And Satan laughed. Don't expect the devil to give a good testimony about you. He will always give a reason. He knew that was true. No other person than the true one. The one who called himself the truth. I am the truth, the way, and the life, said it. So it cannot be faulted. So instead of faulting it, he started looking for a reason behind it. And does Job serve you for naught? You've done this, you've done this, you've done this, you've done that. And you see, in a sense, Satan will be true in certain economy. There are because there are those who serve God like that. But I want to tell you this morning, if you are serving God for the benefit, you won't last. What are you saying, preacher? Come, uh, come clear. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying if you are serving God with a mind for benefit, you won't last. But let me also say this. Serving God has many benefits. And I'm not confusing you. Just follow me. If you are serving God because of what you will get out of it, you won't last. But serving God does not make you a loser. It, it does not even make you unnecessarily a poor fellow. He promises he will bless you. He said nobody ever forsake anything for him in this life that will not get it back in double fold. And in the kingdom of God, eternal life. He said so. So where is the reconciliation? You serve God because you love him. Hmm? You don't know how deep that is. Let me show you how deep it is. The three Hebrew children. They came before Nebuchadnezzar. Now, don't forget, 
their background was captives in Babylon. And these captives, because of the vision of Jeremiah, they rose to a level that they overcame the challenges in the land of their captivity because they were in the basket of figs that were very good. If you ever studied the vision of Jeremiah, he told them, you all are going to go into captivity. Amen? And God was not ready to block the captivity. He said, you will go. Then he said, this bucket, basket that has good figs, they are going into captivity for their good. These ones with bad figs, they are going into captivity for their evil. So God is not going to stop the good from going into captivity. His own children. And he's not going to stop the wicked people from going into captivity. All of them will go just the same. That doesn't look nice, isn't it? But it is the way of the Lord. Your shepherd selected. You know, now that such a gospel will not sound so popular. So it created an emergence of emergency preachers who were trying to teach the people what they would like to hear. Initially, they said there will be no captivity. When the captivity began, they said it wouldn't be long as that. Some said two years, some said seven years. God sent Jeremiah back to give the part two of his sermon. He said this captivity will be long, very long. Seventy years in the minimum. And he said, you see, the attitude I want you guys to take is to settle down in the land of your captivity. Build houses, start your businesses, let your children get married and live well, and even pray for the country that is holding you captive for their peace because it is in the peace of that country that you yourself will be, will be peaceful. Then when those brethren were looking, what kind of a gospel it is? God said, trust me. The thoughts I have towards you. That was where that statement came out from. Is the thought of good and not of evil to bring you to an expected end. That verse came out of the need to give comfort to God's children whom God has ordained to go into captivity. Are you catching it? You know why God did that? Because it will take the captivity to bring out the best in some. It will take the captivity to wave them as his masterpiece and to make them immortal today. Daniel, you're bearing that name. Do you love it? Do you know that that name came out of captivity? Daniel was always in Israel as a young boy. Nobody knew him. Because what it takes to single him out for immortality can only come in the land of captivity. There was no fiery furnace in Israel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they needed that fiery furnace. Are you catching it? So this was why they had to be brought to the land of captivity. So whatever God brings you to is to single you out. None of your experience is to destroy you, to make you doubt the message, or go out of the kingdom, but it is to establish you as a hero for the kingdom. Esther needed that. Esther was a product of captivity. Without captivity, you will never know her. Ezra was a product of captivity. Zerubbabel was a product of captivity. Joshua, the son of uh, Josedek, was a product of captivity. Nehemiah also lived in captivity. Joseph also had his own captivity. All the people that are mounted as a great influencers. I love this kind of social media influencer. That's the kind of influencers I want. People who lived in environments that were so awkward and so hostile, and they overcame the environment. They overcame the king's land. They overturned the king's decree. Oh, man. Hebrew 11 heroes. Come on, brethren. Don't you like that? Wherever you live is not a disadvantage. Live under the seat of Satan. You will defeat him. If you've got what it takes. Pagamos was sometimes the seat of Satan. The prophet said, the beauty of it, the story, was that children of God lived in the throne capital. 
of the seat of Satan and they were defeating him right there. You will overcome all your obstacles, all your challenges, wherever you are, because he that is in you. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Live in America, live anywhere. It doesn't matter. Brother Bram said, look, carry your children to the wilderness, to the jungles. He said, what is in them will come out. So let's not take the attitude that it is an environment, it, it's only an environment that protects a child. Let's lead them to Christ. Wherever they live, they will rise up and be a champion. I'd rather be an all-time Christian than anything I know. Nothing can intimidate a Christian. No habit can influence you better. Because when you take that name, that identity, you have taken the greatest citizenship. You love him, church. So, but this is where I'm going to. So I can drive it home. You serve God because you love him. So I'm trying to use the example of these young brethren. Watch the attitude now. They became governors. Great men. But you see, in the land of captivity. But you see, they were prepared for everything. Even the governorship and the scholarship that came with it will never make them compromise. Many of us will rather injure God than injure men. Come on. The king said, when they told me, I did not believe. This is why I've called you. because You are my boys. You are the one taking charge of the kingdom for me. The kitchen cabinets, the cabals. <laughs> he said, I thought they were lying on you. You've got to do it right in my presence. Uh, the, the, the press men are not going to know about this. It's a closet affair. Uh, the guy said, God bless you, my brother. He said, we will not be careful to answer. In other words, we will not hesitate. And we are not afraid. But they were not arrogant. They were humble about it. O king, live forever. And they never got annoyed. It was the king who got annoyed. So you can tell who had the right spirit and the wrong spirit. Come on, church. It said, we will not be careful to tell you our own mind about this matter. King, give us 10 chances. It will still be the same answer. We are not going to bow down. You see, we know our God can. Every believer must know what God can do. I'm separating it for you. What he has the ability to do, even if he chooses not to do. We know he's not doing is not because he can't. Oh, But here is a Christian who understood the sovereignty of God. Here is a Christian who wants the will of God in all situations above anything. Even if it comes at a great cost. If they could just settle it in the heart that that is God's will. They surrender. They say we know our God can and will deliver us. But King Excuse me, king, if he chooses not to, not because he can't. Come on, church. I don't like Christians who think they are giving testimonies after serving God for many years. And a situation will come and say, God, for me to know that you are God. All your 20 years have been a waste. That's what you are saying. It will now take this one for you to know he is God. So what has it been all along? Come on church. Is that fear to God? You've been with somebody for 20 years. You don't still have assurance that he is God. So it will be this one that he will do. And once they take that habit, watch it again. When another challenge comes, they forgotten they knew him to be God. You won't last. Now compare your testimony with that of these brethren. It said, we know our God can. That he can do it, he settled. But if he chooses not to, yet we will not bow. Those are Christians who serve God because they love him. 
So nothing about God will ever disappoint them. Are you catching it? That's the underlying thing. Just like the prophet would say, if I ask him for this, and if he doesn't give me, I will say, thank you, Lord. You know what is best. So what I get and what I did not get is not my remote control for service. Because I will come back to Job, who worshipped God in the most critical time. Do you know the response of Job to all the calamities that befell him in one day was what? Worship. Did you catch that? We read it together. Simple scripture reading. Four messengers came with four messages of doom. As this one was finishing, this one took it off. As this one was finishing, this one took it off. And by the time they finished their report, it took care of everything Job ever had and will have ever had. Everything were wiped out. And the Bible said Job rose up. Shaved. He even took time to clean himself up. To watch his manners in appearing before God. Come on, brother. Come on, brother. In other words, nothing will be too overwhelming for him. Nothing will bring him under a pressure to misbehave to God. You were going to the same heaven this brother went. And guess what? They lived before the blood. Seemingly at the time that we can say they were being anointed and inspired by the Holy Ghost. But do you know today, you live by the Holy Ghost. You have him as a possession. Not something that comes upon you to anoint you. If people who lived under its inspiration could live that much life. Amen. Did we read it together, brother? So all this petty bread and butter Christianity approach, you should be dropping it by now. You should be dropping it. Amen. Things will happen and you'll be so, everybody will be so worried and concerned about, not about what happened, but will be so worried and concerned about the continuity of that person in the Lord. Because of the utterances and the behaviors. Look, if anything throw you out of the kingdom, you were never meant for the kingdom. Because none of us can be lost. Not by anything. You say, give me a scripture for that. Plenty of scripture. I've just been analyzing one for you now. What could be more dangerous? What could be more, what could be more cruel a death than to be roasted in the fire? And some folks were ready to enter the fire for the Lord. And say, you, you see, we've saw, we saw some sisters who refused deliverance. It's in the book of Hebrews 11. Because of the hope of a better resurrection. What could be more cruel than that? And what could be more assertive, as Paul to say, what shall separate us? Huh? From what? From what? Can you underline it? The love of God. We serve him because we love him. Brother Bram said, if my years of service are over, and he said, once it's over, I send you to her. Come on now. Do you know he said, because by love, his quantity of service still will not reduce. And when he eventually gets to that hell, if there's an opportunity there, it will still be loving and serving him. Amen. This was the man Job we were talking about. He was serving God because he loved him. And that was where when he lost all, he didn't change nothing. Our losses won't change nothing. Rather, it will give us a closer drift. Not a further drift. It will bring us closer. Amen. We'll feel a need of him more than. Because we need somebody to close that gap. And the only one who can do is God. So when we lose, God takes more occupation. So that means we get more of God. He fills in the gap more for us. This was the life of Job here. Are you following me? Then, Satan told God, it's because of this, it's because of that. <laughs> God laughed. He said, really? He said, so what do we do? Meanwhile, Job was there in the church, singing only belief, saying amen to the word. He didn't know what God was thinking about him. He didn't know what the plan was. 
You don't know what his plan is this morning. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But one thing I know is that whatever he decides, he has put it in you. He said, how am I sure? The one who is sure knows what he's doing. You think you know yourself. You don't know yourself as much as he does. He created you. Amen. All right. There are deposits. You see, all these years of service in the Lord, you may not feel it. You may not appreciate it. But you know what? A lot of things are going on. Oh, God bless you, my brother. That's exactly what I mean. Because this word is powerful. Even if it comes from the mouth of the weakest and is accepted by the weakest, it has started a journey of change. It will be gradual, but it will be sure. This is why you must come to church. Brother Bram said you can't be as good as a Christian ought to be if you neglect coming to church. You come to church for the word. And you come to church to tap into the right atmosphere by fellowship. Because it is the atmosphere that brings the result. I pity those who have been manipulated to stay at home. You will never get better. If you truly believe the message, the message says go to church. You are staying at home to do what? To teach yourself. He said, I want to listen to tapes. I'm sorry if there's anybody with that orientation here. But why am I even saying I'm sorry? <laughs> if I preach the truth, you deal with it. Let me offload it. You say you want to stay home and listen to the tape. You don't believe the tape. I'm challenging you. You don't believe the tape. If you believe the tape, the tape never told you to stay at home. The tape says, come to church. No, I challenge you. Show me where he told you to stay at home and become a one-man evasion church. We know in the Bible there are churches in the family of this and that, but they have elders. They have preachers. Amen. They were only using those places for churches. But it's a full church. That is why we address the epistle to the elect lady. He's not talking of your family. He's talking of the church. The body of Christ who finds suitability in having fellowship in that environment. And they've got pastor over them. This is why you make emergency pastors today. People who haven't met God. They came into it by circumstance. Brother Bram said if a man is not called and is arrogating a call, he will ruin you and ruin himself. The foundation for your program is not the word. The word says come to church. Amen. Amen. And God is conscious of the fact that you have the tapes. And he told you inside the tapes, look, who were not the one, you couldn't, you won't see in any book where he talked about fivefold. Even in the Bible, he didn't mention the use of the word fivefold. It was a coinage of the prophet. It was the message of the hour. And he told you that those fivefold ministries were placed in the body for the continuation of the gospel of Christ. Amen. And they are to be your dress wearer. Yes. They are to clothe you. They are not the tailors. So they won't sew the clothes. They are to serve you the food. They are not the cooks. So they won't cook the meal. But they are the waiters who will bring the food to your table. Don't deceive your soul. You need them to dress you in the garment of the bride. And this is why you must come to church to be dressed. I'm giving you quotations now. Give me yours. I challenge you, give me yours. They manipulate you. How can the influence of a man be stronger than the message in your heart? And let me come for you again. No matter how much you are able to listen to the tape, take it from me, or read the spoken word, 
it cannot be the same with when a gift handle is for you. Because that's the reason the gift you are given. You say you want a quote. Let me give you a quotation. When you go home, go read Take Inside with Jesus. The prophet said, I'm laying these things and giving information. He said, but time will come when these ministers will take it. He said they will open it and make more sense. He used that word. He said, but we are having people who are messing it up. Stop that nonsense. The fact that the evidence of truth is plenty falsehood. Have you seen the $1,000 uh, that is fake? Why? They've not made the real one. You can only fashion the fake after the original. So when you see plenty fake, it's a sign that there's an original somewhere. So it is your duty, your responsibility to look for the original and stay under it. Don't make a poor, vile excuse. Do you know what the prophet said? He said, things that I taught. Go read it again. I'm challenging you. Take inside with Jesus. He said, things that I taught. He said, when these men pick it up on a subject, they can spend six months. He said, because they will have more information. I'm just dropping the seed here, dropping the seed here, dropping it there. But they can sit down under the anointing of God and take it from here, from here, from here, from here, and put it together to make a perfect picture. You think God does not know what he was doing? When he brought the fivefold, you think Brother Bram didn't know what he was doing? Do you care to come to the unity of the faith? Do you care to come to the measure of the stature of a perfect man? If you care to come to that, go study Ephesians 4. He told you why the fivefold is given. He said they will bring you to the unity of the faith, to the understanding of God, and to the measure of a stature of a perfect man. You can't deprive yourself of that ministry and come to perfection. I challenge you. So come to church. If you are being manipulated and deceived, this day is your deliverance. And tell others also that I say so. I don't do my own witch or wizardry in private. I do it in the open. So if you want to challenge me, you will challenge me. But bring your quotations and your Bible before you come. I'm not just going to take it because somebody said it. You love him? You love him? Don't deprive yourself. Come to church and be blessed. So you need fellowship. The right atmosphere. You need the word. Those things will fortify you. Brother Bram said service, church gathering is like an oasis in the desert. He said this world is not a friend to grace. You go out, you rub shoulders with the world. You know what they are doing? Killing your little light. That's what they are doing. Killing you. They make you vile. Show me anything in America, on the billboard, on the social media, in the news, that can help you to Christ. They are taking Christ away from you. Amen. And a lot of you are yielding to that. And you think it's cool. You want to be a canon father in the destruction that lays ahead? Come on. He says, save yourself from this untoward generation. This is why you must come to places like this. After you have rubbed shoulders, you've been battered and bruised. Come here. You will find balm in Gilead. You will find encouragement. You will have healing. You will take a new charge. And you will live with a zeal that I feel like traveling home. Hallelujah. Come to church. Make no delay. The Lord bless you. So, Job was serving God because he loved him. And God told Satan, he said, you know what? The guy is in your hands. Go do whatever you want. Satan told God, I'll make him curse you to your face. <laughs> and God said, don't worry. He said, we don't need to waste our time. The proof is before you. Let's, let the game begin. All this while, Job had no idea. He didn't see a dream. He didn't see a vision. God 
concluded a matter over him. I don't know what is concluded and concluding over me now. Or over you. This is why in our life, nothing happens by chance or by accident. Our lives are too precious to God to allow it to be trifled with. And say, if I have done this, maybe, no, 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 no. The one who could have done it chooses not to do it. Because that was his will at that time. Are you following? All right. And the man left. Satan left and he started his problem. In one day, brother, both the things, he said fire from God. Didn't you read it? He yes. <laughs> said, and God sent wind. Uh -uh. So God was responsible for all these calamities. Do you know what the Bible was testifying to you? That none of those things could have happened if God never permitted it. So God allowed it all. This man was befell by four calamities that took care of his past, his present, and his future. Read it. His future were the children. Everything wiped out. So from future to present to past, or from past to present to future, whichever way you want to arrange it, everything was gone in one day. And my Bible told me, in all these Job's sinners, he didn't even talk. He just said, ah. he said, is that all? Or do we still have something else coming? They said, that is all for now, sir. He said, well, naked I came to this world, and naked shall I go. The Lord gave it. The Lord take it. Blessed be his holy name. He cleaned himself. He took his bath. He washed himself. He went to the house of the Lord, prepared for service. And the Bible said he worshipped. So what was his response to all his calamities? Worship. This is what Satan is trying to take away from him. May the Lord depend on you and I, friends. You see, when that battle failed, round one, that was where God brought us back to another service day. Then they came for another service. Job was still intact. He could come. He had no boil. He had no sickness, terminal illness, or whatever. He could still carry himself. He was in that service. He responded with worship. Nothing tampered with his love. You can see that this Holy Spirit will go from body to body. His character and manner remain the same. Paul, Paul, Paul gave his own as a confession. What shall separate us? Job gave his own as a life. He gave a life that, that shows that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing can tamper with my worship, with my service. Maybe everybody wouldn't have expected him to be in service. That they, they said, bro, Job is already seated. Say, wonderful. So a soul would have been encouraged that day by that dedication. And guess what? He didn't come to service to be moody. He didn't come to the service to be swollen. Job does not dwell in pity party. Whether self-pity or otherwise. Because self-pity is a demon. I connect it back to what I was telling you. When the devil succeeded in making you feel that you are the only one, you entered into self-pity mode. Why me, Lord? And in the course of time, you started seeing others as better advantageous than you. Complex will set in. Are you catching it? And it will become, why me? If it is not you, point to the person it should have been. The one who can, the one who has a better finger has pointed to you. That it is you at this time that he wanted to wave before the people. Job took his own with joy and gladness. And he responded with worship. When you accept it and you are singing why me all the time. After you develop problem with your brethren, you will develop with God also. Because you wouldn't find a need to serve a God. To interact with a God who will put you into such a peculiar problem. 
Because the, uh, it seemed to feel like you are the worst sinner that should be treated with the worst punishment. You see, let me, but let me tell you something. As long as you are still in worship with the Lord, do you know Satan had only taken things around you? He has not yet overcome. He can't claim victory. Neither can he celebrate. Let's watch it with the life of our subject's case study. They came to another service. And Satan came. And God said, how far? Ah, he said, it's not far. Why will it not be far? All the properties were gone. All the buildings were gone. All the assets were gone. The children were gone. Everything over. So how could you say, uh, it's not far yet? What is not far? Oh, our retarget is not met. We took away everything. He's still in service. I didn't expect him to see him in service today. He even sacked special number. Perhaps he's even preaching, preparing to go to the pulpit. And when he gets to the pulpit, he's preaching and testimony will blast me again. Uh, I can't deal with this. God said, did I not tell you? You are wasting your time. Did I not tell you? Now, God now gave all the testimony and added again to his testimony. You are in the spirit. You know, in the first testimony, there was no integrity. Are you catching it? Now, the situation of Job added him more laurels. Come on, church. He added to his testimony. God, God didn't stop. He said, now, you can see that he's a man of integrity. He is consistent on his spiritual stand. If it is sunny, he's a Christian. If it is windy, it's a Christian. If the cloud is all dark, it's a Christian. Inside a Christian. Outside a Christian. Good times Christian. Bad times Christian. What shall separate me? So, he had it to his testimony by his adversary. Daniel, isn't that a wonderful one? Add to your testimony. Praise God, hallelujah. That right now I'm serving God better than I used to be. I'm getting more related to God. I'm going on to higher ground. Amen. Let it come with integrity. How to your testimonies. And Satan couldn't undo that. He said, well, so God said, so what do you think now? He said, what I know is that don't expect commendation from Satan. The day the devil begins to commend you, go and search yourself. Huh? He said, mm, mm. all I know is that all that a man has, he will give for his life. Huh? It's because we have touched everything. So God says, so what do you want now? Let's touch him himself. <laughs> you this guy, you are not tired yet. Let's touch him himself. Let me attack his kidney, attack his liver, attack all the vital organs, attack his entire body. Let me give him something terminal. I mean, that's the summary of it. Uh, they call it this cancer, this, it's, not, it's not to terminate life. And give you the reality that the life is going if God does not show you mercy. Is that not all? So, let me give him some determiner. By the time John Hopkins says that, write him off and say, discharge him, we can't help him again. And give him days. You will see, you will, you will see something. God laughed again. He said, it looks as if you don't know who you are dealing with here. Okay, go ahead. But uh, excuse me. That thing has been terminal, but there will be no termination. Yeah. 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 Let me tell you. No matter how terminal is sickness or diseases, if you can believe me, that's not what kills you. Kills a man. The man eventually goes because the time has come when the time has come. Are you catching it? Then God said, go ahead. It's, it's okay. Let's see if you will win this second time. He put everything that he could, that he could put. Uh -uh. This guy, even though his condition couldn't make him to attend service, on his ash heap, he was still singing and praising the Lord, worshiping. Ah, uh, ah! Uh, Satan said, "I have, I, I have a hopeless case now. 
Then he went for the last straw. He went for the closest to him. If I can't finish this man directly, let me go through. Then, you see, this woman has been very wonderful. From all indication, there was nobody around Job any longer. Maybe it was so smelly. Maybe it was so this and that. But there was somebody who still kept closer. And that was that sister. Now, when he went through that sister, he came in appearance and said, how could it be that the sister will say the exact words that Satan wanted? Do you realize it was the sister? Cause God and die. <laughs> but you are dealing with a spiritual man here. He looked. This is not my wife. Do you have that bond in your marriage? Aha. Uh -huh. Do you have that bond in your union? That when the devil invades, you can say, uh uh. Whatever you call yourself, honey, baby. So they are babes today. You know? And I do tease them. I say, if you start acting or you start acting like a baby, don't get annoyed though, because that's what you call her. There's something in the name, you know? Yeah, you know Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you, babies and babies. <laughs> and God bless you, honest and honest. I mean, I'm just, you know. Okay. I don't have any scripture or message to condemn you. So don't think I'm condemning you. I'm just, you know, we're just pulling ourselves. Praise God. Hallelujah. You love him? Amen. So, I said, ah, this doesn't sound like you. Let me tell you something. Even in that state that could have made the man frustrated, get him like a cactus, very thorny and everything, and feels that, does this woman even understand what I'm going through? Job remained calm, cool, composed, collected. These are the virtues of sons of God. Mind your actions. Mind your reactions. This is the mark of I calling. And I've always seen that all true children of God, they are like that. At some point, they get to a position that they don't act under pressure. I found a David in Ziglag. If you ever read about Ziglag, Ziglag was where they came back trying to fight against the people of God and God supernaturally forbid David from fighting against Israel. But before he returned, the Arabians have taken over everything they had. They've taken them and gone. Ah, when he came with his, uh, with his uh, followers, the followers said, uh, I won't take this all. Uh, okay, master, you must do something about it. Otherwise, otherwise. You know how like touts. David had some of them, they were like touts. Lord, don't, don't, don't worry about that. They were like that. Yeah. But you see, everybody that became helpless, that were neglected, they resorted to David. Yes. And it became an anchor for them. And God was using those ones to train him to be the shepherd of Israel. Because that was the only character God used to describe being a shepherd. <laughs> so don't worry about that. So he had all kinds around him. And they said, well, look, this girl will not level now. I will do it all. Get me my children. Get me my family. The Bible said, David told them to calm down. David encouraged himself in the Lord is God. And he couldn't get under pressure enough to neglect not to seek the will of God. He said, bring me an effort. All your noise notwithstanding, we have to consult God. Eh? So you better calm down, guys. Guys, calm down. If you make much noise like this, ah, yes, you said you will stone me. Even if you stone me, if I have one more breath, I'm going to still consult God. Consult God in this matter. Master, do something. I say, keep quiet. Bring me the effort. Lord, shall I go? Effort is a medium to contract God. Shall I go or forbear? Listen to that. If God had told him not to go, he wouldn't mind all the noise and the threats to kill him. He wouldn't do nothing. He will have stayed. 
But the Lord who saw his devotion, he said, go, pursue, overtake, and recover all. He wouldn't act under pressure. He said, because he said this, that's why I'm saying this. We are still growing. When you come to that mark that God wants you to be, nothing a man says or does bother you any longer. You will rise above it. So, when this sister spoke like she spoke, this sister has an integrity of Christianity. And that was why Job said, uh uh, that doesn't sound like you, honey. No, you are not the foolish woman, but you're speaking like one of them. I know he's responsible. Let me speak back. Shall we only have good and not have a moment? It makes life balance sometimes. He started encouraging that woman instead of rebuking, attacking, or fighting, or making her realize how kind of she is. Sometimes you need the wisdom of a son of God. What puts your family under tension is just permit the use of my word, foolishness. The battles that you don't need to pick up. Things you need to let go. Like the prophet will use the word bypass that. It doesn't make you foolish or stupid. Or reduce you from being manly. No sir. It only describes you with the wisdom of a son of God. Brother Bram said there are times I come into my house. And everything is upside down. He said because this woman stood between me and the public. Do you know how many people are queuing are in the compound? The house environment of the prophet waiting to be prayed for. And yet the man they wanted to come and pray for them is still two weeks away. They will be staying there. So because if I go, another person will take my place. Some of those people, their feeding and their upkeep is at the expense of Mida, Sister Mida. A little sandwich, a little drink, a little dirt here. To cope with that, cope with the children. Sometimes it can be overwhelming. And the husband must understand. He said, this is why sometimes when I come home, I didn't meet the kind of environment I left my home in. The atmosphere. He said, the devil has invaded. That is not the time for him to show the woman how canna she could be. See, this is why he said, you have to be spiritual. You are just a canal bunch sometimes. In fact, you surprise me sometimes. And tomorrow they will say, how many are Christians? You will raise up your hand. I will be the first person. I'm not an hypocrite. I'm a sincere person. You are not, you are a foolish person. Take it from me. The prophet will say, I say ah, something is wrong. He said, okay, Mida, you know, I was just coming. I saw at Macy's there. Yeah. A beautiful dress that I think we should go and get. Say, I, give, I don't need your cloth. Get, done. get out there. Don't disturb me. Hey, I saw. He said, okay, forget about it. Forget about it. I don't need your. Then he said, I take it as a challenge to start doing things. To check that invader. Send him out and bring back the right atmosphere. And he said, watch. Sometimes when... The mother is attacked. The children are also attacked. Is that you just see them crying without no purpose, fighting each other? Everything is on commotion. Now, here is the leader, the householder. This is a proof of your headship now. You come in there and you are a creator of atmosphere yourself. He said, I start doing things. He said, I hardly can boil water, not to talk of cook. He said, But I go to the kitchen, put on the apron. And start doing some things. Say, so while I'm doing that, I'm looking at the face of my wife. I'll gather all the children, try and wash them. These are some of you have the mentality. So it is the position of the sister. I know it's not. I mean, you see, there are two extremes. I'm preaching to a people who are caught in the world of two extremes. Some of you become Johnny, sits down, and he's got to sit down. That's an extreme. If you are a Christian girl and you are holding your husband, you are not born again. You have a bad character. You, are, you have the spirit of Jezebel. And it will send you to hell if you don't repent. Uh-huh. Because you know, the, you know the power of the laws for you. 
and you think you can use it. There's a greater law. Praise God. You live by the kingdom, not by here. Are you listening to me? And the other side is, uh, we don't do anything. In, in the culture, where I, which culture? In, the, in my village where I come from, that village will give you eternal life. You must change your village. You must change your citizenship. Do it as it has been done in the kingdom of God. He said, we will cross our land. It's an aberration for me to ever go to the kitchen. Do what? If my kinsman family see me, they will be so disappointed. Uh, it's a pity. It's a pity that people come to church, but they are not getting to Christ. When it was necessary, Brother Bram did it. Brother Bram will carry lawn mower and go to his mother-in-law's house to go and tidy up the place, get our groceries, and do everything. He wasn't doing that as an American. He was doing it as a Christian to show to us the virtues of a believer. Hallelujah. He said, while I'm doing those things, taking care of this, taking care of that, I'll be watching her face. He said, before you know, he said, Billy, when does Macy's close? When do they close? Um, they close like 8 o'clock. I think we should go and get that dress. Then I know that the right atmosphere is coming back. When you win your house back, if you set a time to eat later, correction becomes easy. That is headship. And this was what Job was applying here. And he was able to win his wife back. And the story ended on a family level. Amen. And... Uh, the devil was panting. He said, I have one more slingshot. He has tried him himself directly. He failed. He tried him by the family. He has failed. He's going to come through the church. That's the last. Isn't that your constituency? Yourself, the family, the church. He will try you by all means. Those are the lessons. Yeah, from the church. He's going to raise adversary. From the brotherhood. Brother Bram said, those brethren, those friends of Job were like his church members. <laughs> they were people with whom he shared the same spiritual values. Are you catching it? So if he doesn't get you this way, it's a world wide web. It will seek to get you this way. It will seek to get you this way. So those of you who are making church, who are making the conduct of a brother, or a sister, an excuse for walking out on the church or walking out of the message. It's because you never believed. Is it because of what this brother do? I don't believe this message again. It wasn't meant for you. Even we feel no loss because you were an intruder. Amen. When Judas went to his own place, he said that he might go to his own place. God knew he didn't belong there. But while it lasted, it was a necessary material, maybe to jolt the church to prayers and everything. The brethren arrived. If we can't finish this, we'll come and connect with that later. Maybe on Thursday. The brethren arrived. And when these brethren arrived, the Bible said they couldn't recognize Brother Job. The way they saw him, brethren, shook them until they went into a temporary coma. Yes, that's what my Bible told me. You know, some of those words, if I use contemporary language, it will get you to understand it. When a man could sit down, like you just do like this, seven days, seven nights, no food, no water, just in a state of shock. What is that? That shows the appearance and the being of Job must have been so, so bad than you can explain. I could almost say this afternoon that nobody had suffered like that man. I could say this afternoon that there has never been an hopeless case better than that of Lazarus. If you haven't suffered like Job, if your case has not been that hopeless like that of Lazarus, 
Why are you complaining? Why would you ever give up on God? You have no right to do it. If you did it, it's at the peril of your soul. Let us repent this afternoon. God bless you. We'll continue from there. How many feels like traveling on? Let's rise up and sing that before we pray. Yes, I feel like traveling on. 42. Oh, I feel like traveling on. Oh, my heavenly home is. If you feel that way, sing it happily. Like traveling. Oh, yes, I feel. Yes, I feel. Hallelujah. I feel like traveling on. Oh, my heavenly home is. Oh, I feel like traveling.
desire this morning desire your thought blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness we have a promise brethren we shall be filled the Lord bless you Amen. kind father we thank you this afternoon for your goodness and for your kindness unto us thank you for expressing this love unto each and every one by speaking to us the way you have done. We we'll pray, Lord Jesus, that you will break the fallow grounds of our hearts, that this seed that is being planted will find a bedding ground to germatize, O God, and make us the trophies of the same. May the after speaker, the Holy Spirit, go with us to confirm these things, to expand it and make it a revelation taking it from our heads to our hearts that we might be able to live by these blessings that by your word we might receive divine energy to begin to do things that we are not able to do before we are taught that as we near your return we shall be looking more like you may the words that we have shared contribute to that changing us from glory to glory till we come to that perfection bless my brothers bless my sisters you know their hard desires, you know their needs, you know their challenges. I pray you will come through for them. Break the tempter's power this afternoon. Take away every gloom and take away every sickness, every infirmity. Oh God, take away every crisis and fill the life of your children with your glory. If you can save their soul, you can heal their body. Dear Jesus, do that for them. I bring them under the atonement, oh God. Those who haven't received you into their heart, Lord Jesus, may this day be their day, Lord. Put that talk in them, Lord. Give them that will, that strength, that appetite for repentance. Oh God, that they might not be ashamed of you, but they might accept you, Lord Jesus. Grant it to them, Lord. Pray for our sister Abby, who is coming to accept you. May you help her, Lord. May you touch her, dear Father. As we shall baptize her with water, may you baptize her with your Holy Ghost. We are witnessing a hard vent of taking a decision for you. Lord, may you hold her hand and guide her through life's journey. May she never backslide, Lord. She will come through our sanctifying time, Lord. May you be her anchor. May you be her strength. May you fill her with your spirit that her life will never be the same again. Touch many more of them and give them such a change, such a deliverance. Give them such an encounter that they might have it from that time experience grant it to us father if they are be sick if they are be afflicted the great physician may you go to work by faith we lay hands upon your children we speak the words of life we speak the words of healing you said you send your word to them and it healed their diseases lord let them accept it lord that it might mean healing it might mean deliverance it might mean victory provision and blessing like never before in their lives bless this audience make them happy set to establish them and keep them solid in you. The week is ahead. May you go before them. Bless them in all activities. Draw them closer to you. Till we gather again. May you keep them in fellowship with one another. And with you, O oh God. Be thou our help. As we commit our going home and all into thy care. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you. Brother Sean. Brother Sheung. <laughs> God bless you all.